With all the excitement on TV these days, who says what you watch it on has to be dull? Not Panasonic, not even in black and white. Because we make TV that pops out of portable radios. TV that shuts up so you can listen to tape. TV that's really easy to tape because it's the world's smallest. These days, Panasonic gives you more exciting ways to watch TV than anyone else in the world. And for us, that's very exciting. Panasonic, just slightly ahead of our time. It floats. The Hoover Constellation floats on air. Floats on its own cushion of air. Floats with you through housework. Yes, the Hoover Constellation floats. It doesn't just slide. There. Just as it floats over the table, so it floats through your housework. A gentle pull, and it follows in your footsteps for perfect all-round-the-house cleaning. So if you want to float through housework, get the fabulous Hoover Constellation. Even the arrival of the Iron Horse and the Industrial Revolution did not substantially change methods of food preparation as can be seen in this Virginia City, Nevada home, built a century ago and still preserved in its original functional state, including its kitchen. The 19th century's age of iron and steel made cooking by brick hearth obsolete. Relatively cheap and efficient iron ranges could be readily installed in the most modest pioneer cabin or city dweller's apartment. Yet without convenience foods, cooking still involved as much time and heat and almost as much effort as in the Stone Age. And even the modern oven, using either gas or electricity for its heat source, despite all its conveniences, such as electric timer and automatic pilot, as in this 20th century demonstration kitchen, still requires as much heat and time for proper cooking as the brick hearths of ancient Rome. Now, at this history-making moment in which man has first landed on the moon, we are entering a new era in space. And here, at the NASA Manned Spacecraft Center, where the lunar explorers will spend their 21-day isolation period, the NASA Lunar Receiving Laboratory contains not only the most advanced scientific facilities and comfortable living accommodations, but its kitchen, with its reliance on modern frozen foods and microwave and quartz cooking units, is in the forefront of a new era in food preparation. Microwave cooking units, like those in the NASA Lunar Receiving Laboratory and this test kitchen, are indeed revolutionary. Keep your eye on the chocolate cupcake. It rises faster than you can eat it. For a main course, how about a delicacy like lobster tails? Ready in less than a minute, with no shrinkage or shriveling, since there is no furnace-like blast of heat. This is cooking by microwave, cooking without heat. Yet the kitchen of the NASA Manned Spacecraft Center's Lunar Receiving Laboratory, limited in its space and in the time its personnel can devote to preparing meals, is designed primarily for the rapid heating of previously prepared cuisines, particularly frozen foods. The modern miracle of quartz and microwave ovens are here, coupled with the advances made in modern frozen food technology. The foods consumed in the NASA Lunar Receiving Laboratory are the results of extensive recipe development and research during the past two years in ultra-modern test kitchens. These foods meet or exceed the high standards of quality and purity set by the NASA Manned Spacecraft Center and have been selected for taste appeal by both astronauts and panels of food experts. In short, for those like the astronauts in the Lunar Receiving Laboratory who must have quality food prepared at maximum speed, there is now the perfect marriage, as in this demonstration kitchen, between the freezer and the microwave and quartz ovens. Such frozen foods as soups, vegetables, and these escalloped apples, piping hot and ready to serve in a few seconds. Delicious entrees like lobster Newburgh, quickly heated to perfection. And desserts frozen solid like Swiss chocolate cake, thawed and ready to eat in five seconds. It is indeed appropriate that the NASA Lunar Receiving Laboratory is equipped with frozen food facilities and quartz and microwave cooking units. Microwave cooking especially is part of the technological fallout, particularly in the field of radar from the past two decades of research and development which has culminated in 1969's landing on the moon. 
Developed as the basic power unit for all these radar tracking stations is an electron tube, the magnetron. And it was discovered that this same magnetron could be used as the primary power unit in microwave ovens. The magnetron, in short, is an electron tube which transmits microwaves, which are much like radio and television waves. But a TV station transmits microwaves of a selected frequency in all directions, and any TV set tuned to that station's frequency picks up part of the transmitted energy and processes it into sound and pictures. Inside a microwave oven, the magnetron similarly transmits waves of energy. But since microwaves cannot penetrate metal, they are channeled inside a metal pipe, down into the oven cavity. Since the cavity is also walled by metal, there's no place for the microwaves to go, but into the food, whose molecular structure absorbs and converts the energy in the form of heat. Yet the nature of food is such that only the food, like this macaroni and cheese, becomes hot. The metal oven, as well as the glass or paper containers, which are all non-conductors of microwaves, remain cool. The new era in food preparation features quality frozen foods served with unprecedented speed and efficiency. Some of the astronauts' favorite dishes include breast of chicken, beef pie, short ribs, and lobster Newburgh. Not surprisingly, many of them are the same as those available at the local supermarket for cooking in conventional kitchens. We live in an age of unprecedented technological achievements, scientific adventures whose full benefits to mankind cannot as yet be fully foreseen. Yet man's greatest adventure may be more than a monumental landing on the moon. It may well be the ever-increasing acquisition of techniques and knowledge technology that can make the quality of life for all mankind richer and more bountiful. You're watching Sleepcore, Pleasant Dreams. First came Russia's Sputnik satellite. Then Yuri Gagarin became the first man to orbit the Earth. Soviet space missions reached for the Moon, Mars, Venus. Now you can see the secret spacecraft the Kremlin kept hidden for a generation. Red Star in Orbit, a special exhibition of Soviet spacecraft and art seen outside Russia for the very first time. Now showing exclusively at the U.S. Space and Rocket Center in Huntsville, Alabama. Don't miss it. The Gemini space flights. The trips are long. The training is hard, like this spacewalk practice. But the astronauts do some things you do. In space, they drank tang. They mixed it like this in a zero-g pouch, because with no gravity, it would fly all over. You don't have that problem. You can mix it in a glass. Up there, they have to drink it carefully, this way. You can drink it any way you like. Tang tastes orangey. Tastes great. Has lots of vitamins C and A. Tang, chosen for the Gemini astronauts. Have a blast. Have some Tang.
off into space. Man, that takes real teamwork. And here's a team of junior spacemen with an out-of-this-world breakfast that teams up V8 juice and Cheerios for flavor and energy. What a treat! A flavorful glassful of refreshing V8 juice and Cheerios with power protein, plus vitamin B1 for go power. And now, here's a special out-of-this-world free offer. This moon rocket kit, both a toy and an exciting game. First, blast off. It separates in midair and lands two spacemen on a moon map. You get this wonderful game only through this free offer. Send your name and address and one V8 label plus one box top from these specially marked packages of Cheerios, Kicks, or Frostios to Moon Rocket Kit, Mount Vernon 10, New York. Get Campbell's V8 cocktail vegetable juice with any one of these Big G cereals. You're watching Sleepcore, media for insomnia. Visitors from outer space! We come in peace to bring you terrific tasting space dust sizzling candy. Space dust? Will you experience the sizzle of galactic grape, orbiting orange, and cosmic cherry flavors? Wow, the cherry tastes delicious! I'm sizzling great! Space dust sizzling candy in your mouth. It's out of this world. Far out! Space dust, available in outer space or your local store. Nineteen sixty-five was a successful year for space science and applications. There were the spectacular results of the Ranger and Mariner missions, and the other significant accomplishments which advanced our programs toward their objectives. These objectives are to explore the moon, the planets, and the interplanetary environment of our solar system, to investigate the sun and its relationship to Earth, the geophysical properties of the Earth, and the physical nature of the universe. To determine the biological effects of the space environment on Earth life forms. And to search for and analyze extraterrestrial life. To develop experiments for manned space flights, which use the special capabilities of the trained astronaut as a sensor, manipulator, and evaluator. To provide pre-doctoral training for scientists and engineers and grants for space science research projects and laboratory facilities to best use university resources for the national space effort. To develop and manage launch vehicle systems on which reliable space transportation for all payloads depends. To conduct research and development on meteorological satellite systems and support the Weather Bureau in applying them to an operational system to develop and apply space technology to other practical satellite applications, such as communication and navigation. In April 1965, one accomplishment in communications was the NASA turnover of CINCOM-3 and CINCOM-2 to the Department of Defense for their operational use. The basic engineering data planned for them had been largely collected. CINCOM-3 was launched in 1964 and maneuvered into the world's first stationary orbit at an altitude of about 22,300 miles over the mid-Pacific. CINCOM-2, launched into the world's first synchronous orbit in 1963, was moved in 1965 to a new station above the Indian Ocean. Now both communications satellites are serving the Department of Defense for voice and teletype to Southeast Asia. Experiments in air-to-ground communications by satellite were successfully conducted in January between a ground station and a Pan American Airways aircraft in flight over the Pacific. The two-way airborne terminal communicated via CINCOM-3 with the California ground station from a position as far away as Hong Kong. And also in 1965, communications for Gemini manned space flights were routed through the CINCOM-3 spacecraft. 
early bird, the first commercial communication satellite, was launched by NASA in April for the Communication Satellite Corporation on a reimbursable basis. The payload was a direct outgrowth of CINCOM development. The first early bird inaugurated live transatlantic programs in April. It also made possible the live television transmission of the Gemini 6 and Gemini 7 recoveries from aboard the carrier WASP. This used the type of transportable ground station first developed for NASA's communication satellite program. In 1965, the first prototype model of an applications technology satellite was produced under the direction of Goddard Space Flight Center. This program is a major NASA effort in communications, navigation, and meteorology. It is concerned with the advanced technology of gravity gradient and spin-stabilized orientation systems. It will also be used for antenna research and the determination of environmental effects on components. Technology experiments for the first flights have been selected, and initial flight is scheduled for 1966. Most significant accomplishment of the meteorological program in 1965 was Tyros 9, which rolls through space like a cartwheel, taking weather pictures of the entire world each day. The Delta vehicle used in launching Tyros 9 has successfully launched 31 satellites in 34 attempts. This includes a remarkable record of 22 successful launches in a row. Once in orbit, ground commands triggered the delicate turning maneuver which put Tyros 9 over on its side. Tyros 9 was put into a nearly polar orbit over the rotating Earth so that it can photograph the entire world each day. The satellite was programmed to take 400 pictures daily. Each day's coverage is converted to NEF analysis maps, which show the storm fronts all over the world. These are made available to weather forecasters for their analyses. The wheel configuration of Tyros 9 will be used in the series of operational satellites developed by NASA for the Weather Bureau. This system will be known as TOTS. Some satellites will carry cameras for automatic picture transmission to small receiving stations all over the world. Others will carry an advanced Vidicon camera with tape storage to send back its global observations to the United States. In July, NASA launched Tyros 10 for the United States Weather Bureau. This latest Tyros joined Tyros 7, 8, and 9 in space and marked the first time that four weather satellites were operating simultaneously. In September, all four storm trackers photographed Hurricane Betsy making it the best followed hurricane in history. Tyros 7 entered its third year of operation, four times the expected lifetime for a weather satellite. Another use for Tyros was weather monitoring before and during the eight-day Gemini 5 manned space flight. Because of a Tyros-based forecast of impending storms in the recovery area, the mission was shortened by one orbit. Nimbus is now the focus of advanced research and development in the meteorological program. Work on the second flight model continued throughout 1965 under the direction of Goddard Space Flight Center. Scheduled for launching in 1966, Nimbus will carry both daytime and nighttime camera systems. An attractive feature of the next Nimbus will be the ability of small, relatively inexpensive ground stations to receive live pictures during the daytime, as well as infrared pictures at night. 1965 has seen notable accomplishments in the lunar and planetary programs. These include the completion of the successful Mariner mission to Mars, the first flight of the new Pioneer series of interplanetary missions, and the success of the last two Ranger photographic missions to the moon. The extraordinary pictures sent back from the successful Ranger 7 mission caused substantial modifications in earlier theories about the moon. They resulted in lunar maps and models of an accuracy and scale to within a few feet. 
The area within the sea of clouds which Ranger 7 photographed was renamed Mare Cognitum, the known sea. Ranger 8 target areas were re-evaluated according to Ranger 7 findings. It was launched in February from Cape Kennedy by an Atlas Agena. has provided NASA with a versatile vehicle system. Since the beginning of 1964, 10 out of 11 launches were successful. The Ranger 8 mission achieved its objectives. Not the least of these was the further qualification of the sophisticated and highly accurate guidance and command systems, and of camera technology. These systems performed at their peak when Ranger 9 was launched successfully in March. As it approached the moon, it sent back from its six cameras more than 5,800 pictures of the lunar surface. Here is a speeded up sample. Ranger 9 marked the completion of the successful program managed by Jet Propulsion Laboratory for NASA. We have learned a great deal from this program about the topography of several lunar areas. For example, we know that the lunar surface within a crater like Alphonsus is remarkably similar to the surface of Mare Tranquillitatis and Mare Cognitum, photographed by earlier rangers. If firm enough, these surfaces may be suitable for the landing of the unmanned surveyor and the manned lunar excursion module. The dark halos around the small craters in Alphonsus suggest past or present volcanic activity. The spectacular final photos of the Ranger 9 approach to Alphonsus were seen live on television by millions of Americans as they were taken. They had a resolution of better than one foot just before Ranger 9 impacted, within a mile of the target. Continuing study of the Moon's topography will be accomplished by Lunar Orbiter. In 1965, a prototype model was completed and began testing. First lunar orbiter flight is scheduled for 1966 using an Atlas Agena D launch vehicle. Photographic reconnaissance will be its prime task and there is considerable flexibility in the way the photographs can be tied together. Last year, 10 potential areas were selected for coverage by the first mission. They include examples of all the major types of the moon's surface to permit assessment of their suitability for spacecraft landings. Each is 22 miles wide and 58 miles long. Nine of the 10 sites are within the area proposed for Apollo manned landings. Lunar Orbiter will approach within 29 miles of the lunar surface at perigee and may remain in orbit for up to one year. This should make it an ideal vehicle to obtain scientific data as well as extensive photographic coverage. The end of the year saw the first flight model of Surveyor in final system test prior to shipment to Cape Kennedy. Surveyor is our most complex unmanned lunar exploration project. It is designed to make a soft landing on the moon and provide a wide variety of scientific data as well as to survey areas on the lunar surface as possible landing sites for manned missions. This flight model surveyor and the prototype which preceded it underwent qualification testing throughout 1965 under the management of the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. The spacecraft was subjected to vibration tests. It went into a simulated space environment in the solar thermal vacuum chamber. With its ground support equipment, the prototype was shipped to Cape Kennedy. Here, it was used to check out launch facilities and procedures. Then it moved to Goldstone Tracking Station in the California desert. Here, it underwent compatibility testing with NASA's Deep Space Network. On November 22nd, a most significant milestone was passed in the surveyor program. A T-2N terminal descent test vehicle performed successfully in a combined tether and descent test 
at Holloman Air Force Base, New Mexico. Prime objectives were to verify the soft landing capabilities of the surveyor's spacecraft and evaluate critical flight parameters in the velocity sensor, flight control, and vernier engine subsystem. You will note that once the vehicle was released from the balloon, there was no discernible displacement in pitch, yaw, or roll. This stable descent attitude was maintained by the constantly varying thrust output of the throttle-controlled engines, responding to the commands of the flight control subsystem. After release, the vehicle automatically adjusted to the planned descent trajectory until a constant descent rate of five feet per second was reached. This constant descent rate can be seen as the time when the stabilizing chute fell to the side of the vehicle. In effect, the spacecraft made a simulated lunar surface landing and was recovered by parachute at an altitude of 500 feet. From this first successful performance of the model, we can conclude that the design is adequate to guide the spacecraft to a gentle landing on the moon. The system will, however, undergo further testing. Many problems, managerial and technical, were overcome during this year of qualification and test. Now a surveyor spacecraft is nearing flight acceptance for the first mission in the most difficult project yet undertaken in the Space Science and Applications Program. Centaur, launch vehicle for surveyor, has completed the first phase of its development program with a successful launch in August, carrying a surveyor dynamic test model. Centaur is now fully qualified to meet surveyor direct descent requirements. The two burn development phase to put surveyor into parking orbit should be completed late in 1966. You're watching Sleep Core. Sleep tight. Here's a new cereal to help keep you in shape for the space age. New Post Count Off, the cereal you can count on. Inside this plane, men are being specially trained for the space age. They're American astronauts in the same state of weightlessness they'll experience in outer space. A rough, rugged business being an astronaut. These men have to be in top physical condition when they face the countdown. And here's a new way to help keep you in shape for the space age. New Post Countoff. Post Countoff is made with nutritious oats. You can count on it. Post Countoff is made in the shape of numbers. You can count on it. Post Countoff has exciting space news on every package back. You can count on it. Start your day a little bit better with new Post Countoff. You can count on it. What would it be like to be on the moon? A question that has intrigued men since long before the invention of the telescope. To travel across the roughly marked surface of our nearest neighbor in space is an experience that men will soon be having. Probably before this decade is over, the first explorers from Earth will have arrived on the moon. But how will they explore a planet without roads, without atmosphere, with gravity only one-sixth that of Earth? Scientists are studying answers to these questions. First, by gathering information on the conditions that will likely be found on the moon, then by developing new concepts of travel for vehicles such as we have never seen on Earth to cross terrain that is unique to the moon. The research starts in a laboratory. Here, the vacuum conditions found on the moon are studied for the effect they will have on lunar soil. The large bell jar has been pumped down to a very high vacuum. Inside is a device that is designed to measure the strength of soil. At its base, there are two disks of different sizes 
and an annular ring. The discs are pushed straight down into the soil and both the vertical force applied and the penetration are measured. This tells something about how much weight the soil will be able to bear. In this case, the soil used is pumice, which is believed to be similar to certain lunar soils. A second test involves the annular ring, or shear ring, as it's called. A known load is applied at the top, and then the ring is twisted. The horizontal force being developed and the angle of rotation are both measured. This tells us something about the amount of traction a vehicle can develop. Here the same test is shown being applied to a gravel soil under similar conditions. Another effect which is studied is that of low gravity, here being tested on a free-falling device known as an Atwood-type machine. It reveals what happens to a soil in gravity only one-sixth that of Earth, where 100 pounds weighs only 16. Here, a soil test disc is shown being attached to a release. When the test is actually run, this disc will be released into a capsule of soil which is falling at an acceleration which simulates the low lunar gravity. The entire device is raised high into the air, then dropped. During the drop, though so rapidly it could not be seen, the soil test disc is released and the effect of low gravity on soil is measured. Based on such tests of soil properties, several vehicle models designed for moon travel were developed. Here is a vehicle based on the Archimedean screw principle, propelled by the turning of four large screws. This wheeled vehicle rolls on six large soft tires arranged on three axles. And this track type vehicle is composed of two units with wraparound tracks. These vehicles were tested in a soil bin containing soils of a type likely to be encountered on the lunar surface. Here the tracked vehicle is made to crawl over simulated dunes of fine pumice. The wraparound tracks are elastic with flexible prongs to conform to the terrain while steering at the pivot between the units. The Archimedean screw vehicle is designed to operate only where the soil is so soft that it cannot support the weight of a vehicle. Hence, it burrows through the soil. It is steered by running the various screw elements at different speeds, managing slow but effective turns. The electric cord trailing behind it is used to deliver power to the model. It is not intended for actual moon vehicles, which will use batteries or fuel cells. Generally, the screw principle is not very efficient and would be used only for special applications, such as this exceedingly soft soil. The wheeled vehicle is mechanically the most efficient and reliable of the three designs. While it cannot perform as well as a track on soft ground, its many other advantages make it an attractive solution to the problem of an all-around moon vehicle. This particular model has three axles or units, individually driven by three separate electric motors. The axles are connected to each other by elastic rods which enable the units to dip and roll with respect to one another. Steering is accomplished by the small steering motors mounted on the front and rear units. The wheels shown on this model are made of foam rubber, but this would not be the case for a real moon vehicle, since foam rubber could never endure the severe lunar temperatures. Instead, a full-size design might feature lightweight wire frames, which would be covered with a thin, tough plastic material. In case the lunar surface does not turn out to be a fine dust, but instead consists of a rough and rocky terrain, the wheeled vehicle will perhaps show itself to its best advantage. The individually powered units have good obstacle climbing ability, even when the obstacles are more than twice the height of the wheels. 
the vehicle can force itself over and around boulders, yet always hug the terrain because of its special design, which is called articulated. If obstacles such as chasms occur, such as the space between boulders, the vehicle will bridge the obstacle with its long body. Where one unit has lost traction and cannot pull, the others will push it along. In turn, if they lose traction, they will be pulled along so that the vehicle remains in motion whatever the soil or terrain. In general, the wheeled vehicle seems a promising solution to the problem of moon travel. Yet much work remains to be done. Further and more realistic, testing in the moon environment must still be accomplished. New moon vehicles will be conceived, designed, and put through their paces so that the astronauts of tomorrow will have the vehicles to carry them safely to the farthest reaches of the moon. <laughs>